Hello everyone and welcome to the final session, the grand finale of series four of the Public Interest Technology PIC Colloquium. And what a session we have in store for you today. Over the last four months, we have had the immense pleasure to host this wonderful series. And like every other week thus far, we have an engaging program lined up for you. But might we just say, an extra special occasion, as it is an honour for us to host and to have with us our colleagues and collaborators from the, the University of Wollongong Global Network presenting on one panel. My name is Roba Abbas and I am an Academic Program Director in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia, and also the Socio-Technical Systems Technical Committee Chair at the IEEE. I'm joined today by my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, who is the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University. Katina is also the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. Katina and I would like to acknowledge the work and support of Melissa Way and the events team at the College of Global Futures at Arizona State University. Before we commence today, I would like to take a moment to reflect on the series to date. We journeyed from series one, which focused on values, responsible innovation, and COVID-specific technological responses, onto series two, which centered on storytelling, imagination, and participatory design methodologies, to series three, which emphasized the global perspective with respect to the social, the regulatory, and the ethical considerations relevant to the design, development, and delivery of technology in the public interest. In this series, series four, as we reflect back, we have illuminated a path toward transdisciplinarity, hosting international speakers who have shared with us their perspectives on experts and expertise, innovation ecosystems, multi-stakeholder approaches, and the opportunities and challenges relating to addressing complex societal challenges. Today, we're in for a real treat, everyone. This final panel has joined us uh, to talk on a variety of issues related to leading thought in artificial intelligence and in a variety of application areas. Roba and I have had the pleasure of working on a joint grant together and on other projects throughout 2022 with this wonderful panel. I'm really, really so proud uh, to be presenting this with Roba in the final session of the final series uh, this 2022. It's only fitting that we celebrate together. And in introduction, first up, we have Ruan Bandera. speaking on human resources management, technology management and leadership. And Ruben has a fascinating background, having worked in not-for-profits previously, conducted much research on consumer privacy and the privacy paradox, and now is dedicating much of his time to human resource management and AI bias. Fascinating area. Ruben has published in many of the top tier business journals since leaving the third sector to focus on academics. And following Ruben will be Yi Yang Bian. who together with Ruan is in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Dubai, the oldest non-Emirati private university in the UAE. We're all proudly to be affiliated in some way with that university. Yi Yang Bian will be speaking on demystifying metaverse as a new paradigm of enterprise digitization. Wen Lin Ko is our speaker today from UOW Malaysia. and will be presenting on a trending topic related to business digitalization, fintech, AI, blockchain, P2P lending, virtual reality, digital payment. This is particularly prevalent when we link to Beyond's talk on the metaverse and the future of e-payments. We then have Prithvi Bhattacharya, on data science towards a cross-sectional framework for optimal modeling for business problems. Prithvi is also located at UOW Dubai and has re really championed a great deal of the data science there and analytics work, having completed studies at the University of Melbourne, Australia, among other certificates at MIT, and applied his skills to some of the largest consulting companies in the world. Our second speaker from UOW Malaysia is Associate Professor J. Joshua Thomas. And he will be presenting on deep learning applications, a pandemic public interest binding solution. Associate Professor Joshua has a physics background and is engaged in numerous grants 
among them digitizing the Pleasant model with multidisciplinary framework for cancer survivors' well-being. Our sixth and final panelist, perhaps could be considered as the heart of UW Dubai in some way, is the brilliant Zenith Reza Khan. Who is a veteran at UW Dubai, starting off uh, in some very introductory roles and becoming uh, an associate professor down the track. So inspiring, having begun there in 2001. She is the founding president and board member of the Center for Academic Integrity in the UAE, assistant professor of cyber ethics at Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences, and program director for freshman pathway programs. I think it's probably time to give our guests uh, a chance to speak, Bravo. So first up is Ruan Bandara. Thank you, Professor Katina and uh, Dr. Roba uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you uh, again. Uh, good day to everyone. I'm Ruan Bandara. I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Faculty of Business at University of uh, Wollongong in Dubai. So today in my short uh, uh, talk, uh, I will be sharing about some ideas about uh, the importance of responsible leadership, especially in the context of uh, HRM and technology management. So this is, this is my uh, key uh, interesting in area in, in, in my research, I can say, uh, where I look into the intersection between uh, technology, digital transformation, and, and leadership. So uh, I'll jump into the presentation. So as you are aware, uh, digital transformation in terms of, especially in the context of HR, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomous robots, these, these technologies are transforming how we work. So there are a lot of uh, possibilities, opportunities that future of work uh, brings to us. There are a lot of advantages and so on. As, as you can see here, we are using these technologies, digital transformation uh, to, to hire and fire people nowadays. We, we focus on ensuring diversity through uh, uh, using AI and algorithms. And also uh, other issues such as uh, worker safety, uh, work health and safety overall, and so on. So there are a lot of benefits, possibilities, advantages that we had uh, we haven't had before that digital transformation is is bringing uh, to us. Uh, it's, it's it's going to be an amazing future. But as I mentioned here, uh, there are a lot of challenges. There are there are significant challenges for several stakeholders, including uh, challenges such as privacy violations, security, uh, lack of autonomy, uh, high surveillance, discrimination, biases. All these challenges are causing us to rethink some of the things uh, that we that we do uh, in terms of, in my case, in, in HR context, in the workplace context. So there are a lot of challenges uh, that comes with all these endless possibilities. So uh, I think in managing these challenges, leadership plays a key role. This is where the intersection between technology management and leadership comes into my, into my research and into my uh, teaching and so on, because I think uh, uh, leaders have a, have a great role to play here, especially with the enormous power uh, that 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 we get with what we do with data these days. We collect large volumes of data uh, in real time, and and we have a lot of data and this which which gives us a lot of decision making abilities and and influence over the other. So uh, there's a lot of power in the hands of few. So algorithms, data, machine learning, all these things, autonomous, uh, autonomous uh, robots and algorithms, automation overall, gives us a lot of power for those people who are in management, who are in decision making. So I think with that, there's a lot of responsibility comes with that. 
so I think with enormous power, that's one research area which I will uh, focus, uh, which I will talk about very soon. There's a lot of power that comes with uh, these large amounts of data and, and uh, this automation. Companies, yes, they are driven very much by these technologies or technological transformation due to efficiency. Because in terms of increased performance, productivity, and, and um, let's say saving time uh, and so on. For example, we can we can uh, sort out or screen thousands of CVs in a matter of minutes using algorithms nowadays. And you compare it with traditional screening, you know the amount of time we can save, amount of money we can save. So companies are driven, highly driven by this efficiency gains. So Yes, leaders uh, leaders need to make sure that their companies are efficient and at the end of the day reach their performance goals and so on. But as I said before, there are a lot of risks involved. There's a lot of uh, challenges involved, especially in terms of uh, what, what uh, uh, Professor Katina Rob and our research team uh, focusing on these days on, on uh, especially algorithm bias. These challenges are, are very risky to all many stakeholders. So I think it's, it's leadership who has to play a key role. Yes, regulations and other structures, other measures and stuff have a role to play, but I'm focusing on leadership and, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm focusing especially on responsible leadership. So we are talking about, you know, uh, the, the challenges, what will happen when machine starts to think but, but I, I agree with uh, Frederick Skinner, who said the real problem is not whether machines think, but whether men do. So it's, it's up to us, as, especially as leaders, how to responsibly manage this technology, this uh, technological transformation. So in that context, I, I, I heavily focus or, or, or I, I promote rather responsible leadership, which is, which is a very, uh, prominent sort of a leadership style that that is that is I think highly relevant to today's context. So the, the, the speciality of responsible leadership is that other leadership styles like transformational leadership, certain leadership, ethical leadership, they they always focus on the leader subordinate or leader follow relationship. But the speciality with responsible leadership is that it focuses on the leader stakeholder relationship. So it goes beyond that leader follower relationship to include stakeholders like investors, our vendors, our employees, our customers, the society, the law, the environment, all stakeholders in making decisions when we achieve our goals. And also this relationship between the leader and stakeholders are driven by value-based and ethical principles, which is very, very relevant to how we need to manage technology. And we are also talking about, in, in terms of talking about achieving goals, we are talking about sustainable value creation and social change. Whereas in, in other leadership styles, other management styles, we focus so much on performance gains and so on, where what we try to achieve through responsible leadership is this sustainable value creation, which means not only in the short-term profits, but we are focusing on not only short-term performance and efficiency, but also longer-term benefits for all stakeholders involved. So we are, we are looking at a much more broader, responsible approach to managing stakeholder relationships and also creating social change through our uh, leadership. So this is really important. This is, this is very different. I, 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 I'm not wrong in saying this is kind of the only leader leadership style or leadership theory that focuses on entirely on different stakeholder approaches as well as you know creating sustainable value through leadership and uh, relationships that is uh, uh, practiced in, in, in the real world so uh, why 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 i focus on responsible leadership is is, is my own research that triggered me to further continue on this uh, on this road of responsibility and digital transformation for example some of my work i have highlighted here first on the power responsibility dynamics and consumer privacy concerns where i, I researched about how companies need to manage power and responsibility equally 
in order to maintain, in order to sustain over a period of time. Otherwise, uh, there's going to be uh, uh, there's going to be responses from the individuals, which is going to be threatening to the organizations in the longer term. So, as I said before, with power, there's a lot of responsibility, and and AI and and these new technologies are giving the leaders, the decision makers, a lot of power, but they need to uh, manage that power responsibility. So that is that is uh, uh, an important study I did on privacy concerns. So when companies cannot manage uh, consumers' data responsibility, there's going to be uh, uh, there's going to, they have to pay a, a penalty. I can say there there's going to be a backlash from stakeholders. And, and, and the second point here, I have mentioned the influence of data-driven HRM on employee well-being. Uh, here, what I've tried to understand is, you know, algorithmic uh, HRM or uh, using AI for HR decision-making, such as hiring or training and development, is impacting uh, employees' psychological, social, and physical well-being uh, in, a, in, a, in a huge way. So here I, I talked about the importance of responsible leadership again, how that uh, managing not only efficiency gains, but also ethics, how efficiency ethics and what we call endurance of leaders, which means in the face of challenges, how leaders can still move on facing these challenges and how, how that will ensure the uh, employees well-being over a uh, longer period of time. And the third uh, one I have highlighted here is the leading responsibility in the Asian digital age. Uh, so here I have taken a, a macro view of the importance of responsible leadership, especially in the Asian region where many Asian countries such as uh, India, China, uh, UAE, these emerging markets in digital technology, uh, how, how important it is to uh, focus on responsible leadership in, in uh, becoming digital leaders. Uh, in, in, uh, in the future. So this is more like a macro perspective I've uh, taken here. And uh, the projects we are working currently among us uh, with this research team, uh, especially two projects I would like to highlight here, using ethical management of AI to transform burden of ethics into economic opportunities. Ethics have become a burden for leaders, privacy, security, surveillance, this, because there's backlash, there's challenges, risks, but we are here focusing on how to uh, capitalize on these challenges and still gain economic uh, advantages for companies so that they can still focus on both things and ensure that all stakeholders uh, thrive at the end of the day. And the last project we are focusing on is uh, AI bias, inclusive smart cities and future of work. Here we are especially focusing on algorithm bias how important it is to manage bias and ensure uh, inclusivity. So what's, what's inclusivity in the, in the algorithmic management context? So here we are looking at from a multi-stakeholder perspective, what, what uh, inclusivity is in, in these uh, future of work uh, scenarios. So these are some of the things I'm, I'm working on with, with my colleagues at the moment. So the, the key message here is that there's great power uh, that, that comes with uh, these technologies, the data we have, the decisions we make, and there's, there's, there's going to be a lot of influence we can make on other people's lives. But the importance of responsibility, especially as a leader, is enormous. So we need to manage this power and responsibility equally. So it's really important. And, and by the way, it is, it is not only Spider-Man who said this, that there, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of philosophers who talked about managing power and responsibility equally. So yes, so this is this is the key message I have for you today, uh, that it is really important that as leaders, as, as individuals, that we are responsible in uh, managing digital transformation. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Roba. Thanks to Dr. Katina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Ben from uh, University of Olengo in Dubai. And the topic for today is Demystify Metaverse as a new paradigm for enterprise digitalization. This is the contest for today. So <clears throat> to begin with, Dataverse is kind of the 
uh, metaverse is the kind of the forefront uh, for the next evolution of the IT industry. As uh, Connect uh, 2021, which is last year, the former Facebook CEO introduced the meta. So which brings Facebook into the metaverse era. So the new schema that the meta plans to build will help users to communicate, to collaborate, to contact and act in various uh, business contexts. So uh, Microsoft Mesh was uh, unveiled during the Microsoft Ignite event in 2021, which is a new mixed reality platform that will help users in different geographical locations to join shared and collaborative experiences and offers uh, virtual reality meetings with enterprise aid securities. So we can notice that an increasing number of rebuilded IT companies and platforms are beginning to position themselves in the uh, sphere of the metaverse, attempting to lead the changes that the metaverse will bring to new digital business. Um, recent uh, report suggests that the virtual realities could have a transfer transfer impact on the global economy. In the for instance, in Asia, the metaverse's contribution to gross domestic product in Asia would between uh, 800 billion to 1.4 trillion US dollars per year by 2035, especially in some countries like China, Japan, India, South Korea, so on and so forth. So let's take a look at the uh, UAE because we are currently in Dubai. So Dubai metaverse strategy is kind of like uh, creating jobs, enhancing the technology trends and opening up some business opportunities and improving the uh, Emirates economy. So this strategy also intends to uh, ensure that the metaverse increases its contribution to about like 1% of the Emirates GDP. So let's go back to the concept of metaverse. So definitely different people, different organizations have different definitions. So in this presentation, we define metaverse as an immersive virtual world that people interact as avatar with other individuals and organizations. So using some, you know, uh, different kinds of the characters and the rules on the real world, but without its physical limitations. So the focus on metaverse is in its use by users and organizations who might be physically and organizationally uh, dispressed and rely on the collaboration technology to conduct the business activities. So metaverse has been involving and uh, it will become a new digital platform for commercial interactions. The revolutionary nature of metaverse is like to uh, give rise to a range of new technology advertisements in a long line with IT technologies such as uh, AI, VR, MR, uh, BCI, and so on and so forth. So instead of uh, uh, all of this, like this kind of the uh, revolution can provide enterprises with a novel approach to collaborate with partners and overcome existing barriers in enterprise digitalization. And so again, digitalization, we usually discuss about digitalization is a kind of a quite hot topics in the past decades. So digitalization has been recognized as one of the major trends that change business in the future. So we define this concept here as the changes in the way of tasks, roles, and business processes caused by the adoption of digital technology in the organization or in operating environments of the organization. So to achieve this, Metaverse might provide a comprehensive scenario for organizations in digital transformations and will change the business environment where enterprises operate today. So it is believed that the techno uh, technicals and applications under Metaverse have not been fully explored, right? Meanwhile, there are still many, many unsolved problems for enterprises in landing on metaverse so for instance how enterprise can get permission to collect like biometric data from users right and such as like physiological response like they bring waves patterns for providing some services so metaverse is a brand new uh, enterprise uh, pattern for many technical people as well as most business managers. So that's this presentation will like explore the mechanisms of digitalization in the metaverse environment with several enterprise dimensions and outline a conceptual framework of metaverse-based enterprise digitalization. Okay. 
uh, we have witnessed the transformation of the new business environments with information technology, such as like uh, e-commerce, uh, cloud computing in the past several decades. So hence, the metaverse has opened the door to future digital collaborations where users can work in virtual world that resembles the real world more and more. So with metaverse, a person will be able to uh, you know, teleport instantly as a, a hologram to be at the office without a commute. Enterprises personnel will be able to spend more time on what matters to their organizations, cut down the time in traffic, right, which is very essential, uh, especially in some big cities. So implementation of applications and technologies in metaverse will accelerate the process of enterprise digitalization. These systematic digital solutions, such as uh, like some of the solutions provided by Microsoft, uh, Meta, right, are adding some new dimension to business collaborations. So according to the previous literature, uh, we define four dimensions of metaverse for enterprise digitalization. The first one is blockchainization. So it is refers to uh, applying blockchain-based technicals in business collaboration, like product and services. The, the blockchain technology is like foreseen as the core uh, backbone of future organizational IT infrastructure by enhancing its security, data management, and process automation. So a blockchain network is essentially a trustless peer-to-peer -peer and continuously growing super ledger of records that have been applied among the enterprises. It enables uh, business applications and sy systems to operate in a fully uh, decentralized uh, environment without the need for any third part or trust authorities. And next one is gamification. Right? Gamification is a very effective way to engage, especially and motivate younger workers and collaborators by using game-like user interfaces in one of the major human computer inter interaction trends of the, this century. So it has like significant benefits with the company in terms of improved employees working motivation, uh, working effectiveness, uh, information transforming, so on and so forth. Okay. And next one is tokenization in economies. So people constantly hear about digital assets and tokenization. So how to transfer a physical asset to a tokenized asset in, is still like under exploring by enterprises and universities and institutes. So currently like digital assets are usually in the form of like cryptocurrency and security token and utility tokens so and so forth. So with the, the development of the blockchain and IT technologies, like individuals like us and, and organizations are obtaining uh, various digital assets. So digital assets have enabled our globalized society with the abilities to efficiently transfer the value actually. And a token is usually referring to a digital unit of the crypto uh, currency that is used as a specific uh, asset or to represent a particular use of the blockchain. So token ha uh, have had like multiple uses, uh, which attract researchers and practitioners to explore this area. Right? So in metaverse, uh, token will help users to understand and evaluate how much an asset might be worth in this virtual world. And the last one is virtualization. Right? Virtualization is the key in both metaverse and enterprise digitalization. It combines the real world with the digital world. So which like perceives and interacts with each other in the metaverse. Uh, some technologies such as like VR, uh, AR, uh, MR will be used to support which, uh, virtualization process created. So in virtual world, uh, with the world of the metaverse, uh, virtualization can provide as uh, solutions for most components in the business environment, such as implementing data centers with networking and collaboration at different levels. So with this virtualized uh, server approach, enterprises will be able to deliver to countless customers the highest quality products and serving anywhere and anytime in metaverse. And let's come back to the four Ps of marketing mix, right? This is a very classical theory. So there are people, place, product, and process. So people in, in, uh, in organizations are involved in the interactions with each other during the product designing, 
process planning, system configuration, enterprise organization, and so on and so forth. And so generally speaking, the four dimensions of the meta will work jointly with people, product, place, and process. So because of the time, I'd like to share some of the highlights here. So first one, blockchain multiply uh, for peace. The first one is people, right? Blockchainization in metaverse will empower people with machine trust and encrypted information sharing. Uh, the trust of interactions among entities in the metaverse will be realized by a novel credit rating system so via blockchain technology naturally. And another thing is place here. So a shared place in metaverse for uh, enterprise will be boundary breaking and formulated as a virtual ecosystem. So blockchainization can also prevent data frauds from uh, from, from being a uh, metaverse to real locations by deploying a decentralized network for manipulating and transforming uh, crucial business data. Next one is gamification. So a new social interactions contact has merged with characters of the gamification. The gamification will empower people in metaverse with new features of social pleasure, uh, advanced networking capabilities and game style engagement. And, as, and here is a, the place. Okay, so the shared place in the metaverse for enterprise will be a mixed online and offline communication with the development of some artificial uh, reality, uh, mixed reality. Okay, so like more and more online stimulated games providing LBS and or location-based interactions for players like such as like game uh, Pokemon Go a few years ago, it's a quite popular ones. So we can see that like the virtual uh, places for enterprise collaboration will be uh, also more differentiatable and diverting. So next one, tokenization. So tokenization will accelerate services, digitalization for users, metaverse tasks, and the business process. It will empower people in metaverse with new tokenized features and more possibilities for achieving win-win collaboration for individuals, users, and enterprises. And last one is virtualization. Okay, so virtualization enables people in a metaverse with new features and teleport. As such, like the virtualization will make an incredible commercial place for different participants within a business to design more vivid and compatible artifacts and also like processing metaverse for enterprises will be enhanced by higher level uh, immersive collaborations and low frictions for uh, for employees uh, like horizon uh, work rooms created by meta provides a way for office workers to connect using virtual realities for consumers the immersive experiences of virtual shopping will, for instance, like will become extremely self-directed, high-touched high and consultable whenever and whenever they want. Okay. So this is table is kind of the innovation case on the metaverse based on uh, enterprise digitalization. In terms of the challenges of the implementing a metaverse blueprint, it is uh, not difficult to build a virtual convergent reality space in metaverse based on the current IT technology. But the difficulty is uh, on how to replicate or map to the real world. Okay. So the realization of this metaverse cannot be completed by one company alone because of the industrial ecology and hardware and performance and the systems like optimizations are extremely complex. Okay. So uh, this presentation gives an overview of metaverse as a potential business platform and process as a framework for enterprise digitalization. So however, there are some risks and disadvantages posed by metaverse in uh, business digital transformation, for instance, like, uh, uh, of course, it will provide us some new job opportunities, but it will also like increase the number of unemployed uh, at the same time and high dependence on the uh, leading platform in the metaverse and potential costs in transforming and protecting their corporate data in a virtual world. So in the future, uh, I believe more work is needed to prototype and test metaverse-based solutions for enterprise digitalization and business transformation. 
So that's pretty much for today's presentation. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Professor. Professor uh, Katina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. <laughs> Uh, okay, my name is Paul Wen Lin. Uh, I'm a lect uh, senior lecturer from the School of Business, uh, UOW Malaysia KDU University College. Uh, so my topic today is uh, I will present to you is the business digitalizations. Uh, it's more on the fintech, uh, our financial technology and the challenges. Okay, uh, so we will start from the introduction part of the our ICT uh, information communications and technologies uh, as we enter the IR 4.0 our industrial revolution 4.0 uh, so we always heard about this uh, blockchain uh, artificial intelligence uh, robotics uh, advisors and so on uh, so these are the common uh, terms that we mentioned in the uh, our this uh, financial sector. Uh, so if you heard about this uh, blockchain, uh, that allows the people to transfer money huh, uh, from one people to another uh, people without going through the bank or the financial service provider. Uh, and there are many financial service industry uh, prefer uh, uh, or refer to this uh, blockchain technology as a distributed uh, technology. And there are some see the blockchain as a more reliable database huh, compared with our existing uh, this, uh, uh, database huh, because now we are using a centralized centralized database. So, but the blockchain uh, technology, which is a distributed uh, technology, uh, which is more secure and uh, more reliable. So here come to the, when we come to these uh, new technologies, uh, and uh, this uh, business digitalization, uh, we mentioned about autom automa they, uh, autom automate uh, our business process and use the uh, AI. And we require, require a lot of talented people. Uh, uh, I mean, especially the, we need the competency uh, from the managers, from the IT specialists, uh, such as from the computer science, uh, big data analysis, predictive uh, analytics, and cyber security, and so on. So come to the issues of competency. Uh, this is a set of capabilities uh, which consists of the content-related cluster of knowledge, skills, and attitude uh, for the sustainable development. So the skill here we mentioned is uh, actually is focused on the problem solving, innovations, and uh, creative transformation uh, in uh, this, uh, our this, uh, profession, organizations, and job. Okay, come to the competence uh, management. Al Medinas and A Medinas uh, in 2019, they defined the stages of the competence management, such as uh, selection, uh, training and development, performance appraisal, and internal promotion of staff. Uh, so this uh, competent management actually is a part of the HR, huh? our HR management. And come to the competency in financial institution. Uh, our financial institution actually operate uh, in a knowledge and technology intensive sector, uh, which is changing rapidly uh, every day uh, due to the new technology uh, coming from the everywhere and uh, our customer demands customer needs and the regulatory requirements from uh, our this uh, central bank so that's why now we talk about the requirements for specific uh, competencies uh, for both the commercial bank uh, employees and their managers and also changing rapidly So if you mention about this uh, competency in the financial institution, uh, this uh, Red, our Red Gurry in 2018, uh, they believe our banks will face more and more uh, stringent 
regulations and uh, complex requirements uh, uh, in order to minimize our business risk. And to comply with these uh, requirements, uh, we need a lot of this uh, robust governance and the complex IT infrastructure. Uh, we must uh, focus and to strengthen uh, all these uh, facilities. And according to this uh, digital banking report uh, in 2019, uh, the use of big data, AI, and advanced analytics was ranked first, uh, replaced the uh, uh, our this uh, how to improve our customer experience as the number one trend for the previous year. I mean now we are focused more on the, this uh, uh, IR uh, four point zero uh, technology, uh, uh, such as this uh, big data analysis, uh, AI, and uh, advanced uh, analysis, uh, 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 rather than this uh, customer experience. So the impact. We talk about the impact of digital transformation of uh, this uh, financial sector. Uh, now we know uh, the commercial banks, uh, they are competing with uh, this, uh, our this, uh, digital bank, uh, the fintech companies. Uh, there are some products are overlapping, uh, but there are some uh, a bit different. Okay? Uh, later, I will show you some example. Uh, so uh, the, when the fintech, players uh, enter our this uh, financial service sectors uh, so now we have uh, the consumer they will have a choice uh, whether they want to let's say for example if they want to develop, uh, open the saving account uh, current account they can go online uh, uh, which uh, they can choose the digital bank which are the fully uh, digital uh, is a virtual banking uh, experience for the consumers and uh, this one, they will give a very competitive, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 I mean, for our commercial bank, uh, how to compete with uh, this uh, digital bank. So in the context of in uh, Malaysia, uh, recently our central bank of Malaysia, uh, that has uh, announced five successful uh, applicants, uh, uh, the new digital bank license, uh, as you can see, number one is our Boost Holding, Sindhiyan uh, Berhad. Boost is actually a one of the digital payment, digital wallet. Uh, uh, they also partner with the RHB Bank. Uh, then another one, the second one you can see is the GXX Bank, uh, which the parent bank, uh, parent company is our Grab company. Uh, Grab and uh, they partner with this uh, uh, the Singapore Bank and also together with the Kok Brothers Sindhian Bahar. And the third digital bank license go to our C Limited, uh, which is, I think you heard before, the e-commerce giant, the Shopee. Uh, they were partner with the YTL Digital Capital. And the third digital license go to this uh, Aeon, uh, our this uh, uh, retail giant uh, this uh, from the Japan, okay, and your credit service and money lion. And the third one is our KAF investment bank. So uh, these uh, five digital banks are going to operate uh, because they just got the, the, the digital banking license and they are preparing all the infrastructure, uh, the facilities and uh, recruiting all the expertise, uh, the talented people. Uh, and the soonest, I think they will start uh, operating by next year, uh, 2023. Okay, so when we come to this uh, fintech, uh, uh, compared with our commercial bank, so now our this uh, consumer, they will have uh, two options. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, if I mean, if consumer they are given the choices, uh, this will make the this uh, financial sector become more and more competitive uh, in terms of uh, uh, money deposit in the bank and uh, whether they want to open the account in the physical store or they want to uh, uh, go online. So we the, there are two issues here. Uh, which is the, what do you call this, technology innovation. Uh, I mean, how creative is uh, our fintech company? How do they attract 
uh, the this uh, consumer to go online. Uh, and another uh, issue is our fintech disruption. Uh, with this uh, digital bank, uh, they will cause a lot of the this uh, what you call the di uh, disruption uh, to our existing commercial bank. Okay, because uh, consumer now they are given choices, uh, and uh, all these uh, commercial bank they will compete with this uh, digital bank uh, in terms of a uh, customer. Uh, I mean the money deposit and the investment, uh, or come to the this uh, our this uh, uh, insurance sectors. Okay. So for this uh, fintech startup solutions, uh, fintech actually company they offer customer uh, the traditional banking and also uh, uh, what what you call the. Uh, business operation. I mean, the customer they when they go online shopping or selling, they can use the uh, online payment. Huh? I mean, whether it's the online banking or the digital payment. So fintech companies actually offer a, a really much uh, what what do you call uh, in this context. Huh? They offer the consumer a faster and a more efficient, more convenient uh, uh, methods. Uh, uh, to complete their this uh, transaction, and uh, fintech actually deliver uh, the services. Uh, I think they should focus on the niche area. Uh, it means their strength should be. I mean, it's a it's a virtual and a digital world. Uh, I mean, the consumer no need to go out. Uh, I mean, uh, no need to travel. Uh, and find the parking or all this. So, uh, I think the fintechs. Uh, uh, this uh, startup company that can uh, cooperate with the existing commercial bank and complement complement uh, each other uh, rather than competing uh, with each other. So we have another technology is the robotic uh, robotic advisor, uh, which uh, this one the robotic actually generate uh, the automation process. Uh, and today's actually the this uh, robotic. Uh, plays a very important role uh, because uh, uh, it automate all the process, uh, business processes, and uh, actually uh, this uh, robotic uh, process uh, actually is uh, what we call we, we say it's a software, a computer software program uh, to robotize or automate all the standardized, uh, iterative or repeat repetitive uh, process. Uh, it means if customer got any requests or queries, uh, they can generate uh, the standard answer uh, to answer the, this uh, customer query uh, 24 seven. I mean, day and night, uh, if the customer got any question or queries, they can just uh, uh, ask this uh, robotic advisor, which will provide them the consultation uh, and give them the, the answer uh, instantly. So this uh, robotic actually actually is one of the most up to date and promising uh, technologies uh, that can change uh, uh, the mindset of our professionals uh, because uh, it automate all our manual work uh, become uh, faster and easy. So if you look at this uh, robotic uh, process automation, uh, is uh, as I say, it's a fully automated uh, program. Uh, it means we can reduce the numbers of workers. Uh, I mean, uh, and uh, at the same time, increase our business efficiency and this uh, reduce also our business uh, cost, operating cost. So there are a lot of advantage. Uh, and uh, beside that, uh, I mean, the robotic advisor provide uh, this 24-7 uh, 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 consultation to the this, uh, customer queries. And on top of that, uh, robotic actually process automation can be an important factor in solving this uh, automation problem. I mean, uh, to to uh, give our this uh, company, uh, I mean, uh, uh, an opportunities uh, to promote their yeah, this uh, business digitalizations. Okay, uh, the advantages as I as I mentioned just now, uh, they can automate all the day to day process. Combined with the business, uh, our existing uh, management technologies, 
and uh, I mean they, they have a great potential. Uh, I mean uh, for all the companies, I mean uh, to operate and to save costs and to enhance their uh, efficiency. So the last part, uh, we beside the robotic part, uh, the blockchain part, uh, uh, we have this uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence solution. Uh, of course, the AI is more focused on the big data, uh, our big data uh, analysis, uh, especially for our e-commerce uh, giant like Alibaba, uh, Shopee, or Lazada. Uh, they are using a lot of this uh, AI uh, solution in uh, this uh, data processing uh, to evaluate uh, evaluate all these uh, customer, the uh, our consumer, the risk rating, and how to open the account, communicate with our these uh, clients, payment processing, currency control, blockchain, and how to handle the request from the uh, different institution and the organization. Okay, come to the conclusion here. It means when we implementing these robotics, so the key. Key uh, uh, process or the key uh, term here is it means uh, we need the talented people which can uh, come up a customized uh, uh, program uh, to fit or to meet our this uh, customer demand. So of course uh, here is the uh, we talk about this uh, competency uh, uh, whether is uh, uh, from the big data uh, analysis from the robotic advisor and from the AI. Uh, 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 all this uh, uh, IR 4.0 uh, uh, technology uh, to generate our this uh, uh, robot robot automation process. Uh, uh, so all this blockchain robotic uh, advisor and this uh, AI, uh, we will expect them to have a very great impact and uh, uh, for our uh, our economic view, uh, our social life uh, in the future coming future. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Prithvi Bhattacharya. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the Faculty of Business at the University of Wollongong, Dubai. And I teach data science to business students. So basically, I'm like a Tinder app um, matching uh, the computer scientists to the business professionals. So and that has led me uh, to this study and, and this talk today, which I title Horses for Courses and Data Science. This is for towards a cross-sectional framework for optimal modeling for business problems. So what's the background? So data science uh, entails a myriad of statistical, mathematical, and computing tools, ranging from things like support vector machines to convex optimizations. These tools present eno enormous promise to solve complex business problems, but these are subject to substantial uh, financial, personal, and temporal investments. However, implementing the tools that are not designed for the problem at hand will be futile at best and detrimental at worst. So uh, just as an evidence of the kinds of things that we have today uh, available to us for making decisions, et cetera, uh, this is a, a diagram which classifies the different uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques and tools based on the type of uh, tools that they are. So for example, under deep learning, under decision tree, dimensional reduction, regression, ensemble techniques, and, and so on and so forth. However, this picture tells us that there's a lot of things out there which we can use for our business, but as a business person, I don't understand any of that. I don't understand what a neural network is and what a decision tree is and, and so on and so forth, right? So that brings me to the study objective, which is to build a prescriptive framework to guide the selection of data science tools from that ocean that I just showed you, uh, based on the nature of the business problem, the type of the business problem, and the constraints on the underlying data that is available to us. Uh, to build our models on. So in terms of the nature of the problem, it's generally classified into three broad types that's uh, widely accepted, uh, descriptive and diagnostic. These are the problems that ask questions like what has happened or what is happening in the business or why did it happen? Then we have predictive analytics, which go one step further and say what will happen and why will it happen in the future? And finally, we have the questions like what should I be doing or why should I do it? Uh, what's my best course of action? 
which is a part of the prescriptive uh, analytics, if you like. So for this study, I'm focusing on predictive analytics because descriptive and diagnostic uh, probably has been done to that. And prescriptive analytics is still uh, in its very nascent stages. So uh, predictive analytics is, is an area that is being widely <coughs> explored by the industry today. So, and hence my focus on predictive analytics. So given that I choose that my uh, business problem is of the type predictive, which is basically what will happen in the future and why will it happen. Now that can be further categorized into a number of types, if you like. So that kind of predictive uh, question could either be a causal modeling, meaning uh, looking at cause and effect of uh, two variables. It could be a value estimation, meaning I want to predict a number. For example, how much will a given customer use this uh, telecommunication service? Or it could be a classification problem. For example, something like among all the customers I've sent this marketing email to, how many are going to respond to my offer? It could be a clustering uh, problem, a typical case of uh, market segmentation. Do my customers form natural groups or segments? It could be a co-occurrence grouping. For example, market basket analysis. What kind of items are purchased together? It could be a similarity matching problem. Finding people who are similar to a certain personality uh, and uh, suggest uh, products and services to them, which is typically done in things like Netflix and Amazon Prime. Then we also have change point detections to detect uh, any alarming changes. Uh, for example, has there been an increase in global temperature over a period of time to alarm us about global warming or is it just uh, something that's happening naturally? And finally, we have uh, the parent of it all, which is the forecasting time series. So what will the temperatures for the next few days be in the city? Purely based on the temperatures that we've had in the past few days. So these are the general types of the problems of predictive analytics. So the framework that uh, I'm trying to work on is for applying this predictive analytics to business practice, which kind of works in an algorithm. So the first task is identify an objective that you wish to meet. And that's obviously driven by the overarching vision, mission, and goals of the organization. Once we've got a very clearly laid out business objective, we need to identify one or more contextual questions that you need to answer for your objective. Then once we've decided those questions for each contextual questions, we determine the nature of the question, which is descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. In my case, I'm, I'm currently looking at predictive only. Determine the type of the questions vis-a-vis -vis its nature, whether it's a classification question, or is it a regression, or is it a co-occurrence grouping, etc. Once we've done that, analyze the underlying data set to identify which constraints listed in the matrix it satisfies. And that brings me to the next slide, which is this matrix. So uh, the goal is to work on a matrix, which has on the left-hand side, the different types of the predictive analytics problems, for example, causality, value estimation, classification, clustering, and so on. And under that, the different techniques that can perform that goal. So for example, the things that can do value estimation for us, for example, like linear regression, non-linear regression, k regression, spline regression, and so on. So basically what uh, the approach here is instead of uh, grouping uh, the different techniques based on the origin or, or the technique that they apply, to group it based on the objective, what are they trying to fulfill? For example, k means clustering, k means clustering are for the clustering category. So once that is done, uh, that's, that's our left-hand side of the table. The top of that table is actually the different assumptions that are taken by each of those machine learning methods, ranging from having to use only numerical data, categorical data, homo, scedasticity, fixed number of clusters, binary classes, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the idea is to mark each of those methods which and with an X for each of uh, the objectives that are needed to be fulfilled for that. For example, for linear regression, we want the data to be numerical. It has to follow a Gaussian distribution, have a linear relationship, have normality of error terms, et cetera. So basically what we are doing is we are kind of, in, in this table, we are creating a list of all the machine or most of the machine learning methods uh, that are widely used uh, based on literature and grouping them together into the type of problem, business problems that they solve, as well as the assumptions that they underlie. 
So the purpose is now once we have this matrix and we have our type of question ready, so we know what the business question is, what is its type, for example, classification, and then we need to analyze the data set to which all constraints listed in the matrix it satisfies. So basically we'll look for a row in this table that matches the nature of the contextual question, in this case, predictive, uh, matches the type of the contextual question, for example, let's say classification, as well as has a blank cell value for any constraint that the data set does not meet. For example, uh, let's say uh, it's a classification problem and I know that my data is does not follow a Gaussian distribution, right? Or uh, it doesn't have any kinds of really linear relationship. In that case, I cannot use the logistic regression method. So what I'll be looking for is any row here that does not have an X in any of those uh, assumptions of those models that with the data set that I have. For example, if I have a data set that does not meet any of these conditions, I'll probably look for a method that has blanks across all of those constraints. So for example, let's say K nearest neighbor or classification trees would be an example where I have a data set which is really nasty, does not follow or meet any of those conditions uh, laid out. So I'm, I, I can uh, safely go and look at that and pick that one. So I say, okay, for example, let's say I'll be using classification trees to solve my problem. The next step is to mark that model, obviously, and then for and do it for all the several alternatives to it. So there could be many of them which meet our uh, requirements. Once that's done, use human expert judgment to assess the suitability of the model and build custom solutions based on the recommended models and assess the quality of the solution. So then we get into the, the normal uh, data science life cycle kind of a thing. But uh, the key part is to identify which, which method are we going to use from that ocean of methods that I just showed you. Uh, and keep repeating uh, steps 3F to arrive at an optimal solution to answer this contextual question, compare if necessary. So, and we need to do this for every contextual question that we need to meet the objective. Now, having uh, done the nitty gritties of it, how does this actually fit into the overall uh, strategy or, or goal of an organization? So, which can be shown in the figure <clears throat> below here. So, I think this is kind, kind of a, a very general figure which everyone's familiar with. So, we have the vision of the organization followed by the goals, and those goals are broken down into certain objectives. And that's where this, this framework fits in. So once we have our objectives listed, which is beyond the scope of, of doing the study, once we have the business objective listed, we need to identify the different contextual questions for each of those objectives. And then we need to decide the nature and the type, look at the data, match the constraints, and find the data science tools as, as I just explained. So just to illustrate this with an example, let's say uh, the vision is to be the first choice car rental company for business users. If that's say we we are uh, uh, we are trying to uh, take Avis or Herds head on, that's that's what we're trying to do. So the goal would probably be to be a pr premium brand car rental company, possibly like companies such as Herds and Avis. The objective could be within six months we want to have ten percent increase in our product sales or you know the rental services. The contextual questions in this case could be given the current situation, what will be our predicted sales in the next six months? So that's, that contextual question can now feed into that framework and see what kind of a question is it? Is it a, uh, uh, is it a uh, estimation question? Is it a regression question? Is it a classification question and, and so on? And that's where our uh, framework kicks in. So once we have got the contextual questions, we go through that framework, identify uh, the right method and, and take it forward. Another contextual question would be, how can we segment our customers to bring about that increase in the total sales. That again goes back to that process of looking through, in this case, for example, it would be clustering and look at the methods, look at our data, what data do we have? Does it meet those uh, restrictions of those models and choose the correct model and, and take it forward. The goal basically of all of this is to provide a practical guide to make astute decisions about the choice of tools to identify an optimal business solution, which I personally found extremely challenging. We, have, we do not have a shortage of tools, but what we have, uh, what I personally face uh, uh, as a problem, as a business, uh, as a faculty member of the faculty of business is that 
how do I explain this to the students as to which one should you use or not just students even to people in the industry like you know they come up with a business problem and they say yeah I know you've got all those fancy tools uh, deep learning and, and all of that how do I use it so I uh, that's that's uh, kind of my attempt to answer that problem now uh, furthermore this embeds an opportunity for a data science project to implement this framework using NLP so which is basically having through a survey uh, having a list of questions uh, that typically businesses want to answer and that could be manually coded as as based on those types and that could be used as a data set as training data to build an algorithm which will automatically classify using natural language uh, NLP techniques like LDA latent Dirichlet allocation or uh, vector space model, whichever is suitable. And that is actually going to take a business question and say, hang on, this question is a predictive question. It belongs to the category of, uh, for example, let's say classification. And based on, on, on the data sets that you have, this is probably one of the solutions. So this is basically automating that, that entire task that I talked about. So getting a machine to do it. So that's the, the next step further. This also lays the foundation for empirical testing of the framework using case studies and validating it, uh, and obviously extend the framework to prescriptive analytics, which is still nascent, but it's it's picking up pretty quickly. And I think personally, I think it's way more interesting uh, than uh, predictive analytics. So uh, that's uh, uh, my presentation, and thank you everyone for listening in. So my topic is on deep learning applications, pandemic bit binding solution. I slightly tweak after listening to my friend, Priti Vedia. So it'll, we'd like to see what's happening, especially uh, model prediction and challenges. So we'll, we are going to see a few things. Um, how accurate is a deep learning model and how to maintain the accuracy or accuracy of deep learning models and challenges and what are the traps and to be looked for? So rather than you identify that as a pitfall, we just try to look at the traps after looking at the problem from the model creation until the end. The third component of a, of a challenge here is how certain and how to avoid the traps for a longer run. Okay? And this is the topic that we try to focus today. Okay? So as you can see that by discussing what exactly we can consider by an attempt of comprehending machine learning or deep learning model. So this is like a very standard framework, or I can say that you have a data, you acquire the data, pre-processing of the data, and you can acquire the data from extract the knowledge. Either you use your statistical probability learn, uh, linear algebra or machine learning based, or you use machine learning alone together with statistics. So you use statistics as a background. Probably you can uh, say that um, I'm going to use a metrics on statistical background point of view. Okay? So I'm sure that many of you are having knowledge in, in, in machine learning. I can see that. And uh, many of them are discussing with industries and while building these applications. So that the question is, do these application prediction are good or how accurate. So I prepare a few slides on that, how you are going to maintain the, the accuracy. So accuracy is one of the metrics. So if you say that in a standard book point of view, this is what we get. You have a 90% is very good, 70 to 90 is good, between 60 to 70, okay. And how you're going to do that? And how you're going to say that, yes, the fraction of predictions or model got right. So if it is useful when all the classes are of equal importance, then you said, yes, uh, my accuracy, even though it's between 70 to 90 is good. When you look at this uh, small graph, so this is something like um, people working on natural language processing. So training keep on increases or training increasingly larger Deep learning models have been used to emerge the trends. You can see those uh, ELMO, Brett L, GRT2. First, we look at this as models often have restricted access. Hence, are not, we are not able to understand substantially whether 
we have enough resources to run these models. Secondly, when you look at the graph, like a, uh, with, with the model size, they are not they are not sustainable. It requires a larger amount of energy of training process and inferences. Thirdly, when you look at this as a exponential growth and with the parameters, so I said. Prithi was mentioned about that. He's looking for NLB direction. So be caution on this uh, model size. Parameters are keep on increasing. And we have limited or limited uh, limitation in hardware maintenance, especially uh, as, uh, we have uh, resources, hardware resources. Okay. So to improve a very standard book-based explanation, you have to handle missing data. Outliers must be carefully done feature engineering. So I just put that purposefully a, a diagram here. A lot of programming is, is behind the scene, each and every component here. Let's say if you are handling a missing values, you need to spend 90% of your time looking at your data. So model is predominantly works well. However, when you're looking at handling missing values, outliers, pretty challenging. But that really helps you to improve the accuracy side. Followed by feature engineering, we improve the accuracy of machine learning models. You can make accurate predictions. You try to do some correlations and different features and create new ones that capture their relationship. Feature selection, goal-oriented, try to eliminate and improve the accuracy. This is machine learning wise. Try multiple algorithms. We have some other work. We have used genetic algorithm light together with RNN, LSTM, GRUs to, to determine driver's behavior while whether the driver is in a sleeping mode or he's tired or something. We can implement, we implemented that into a small dashboard camera. Ensemble models, pretty, pretty useful in terms of deep learning is concerned. As compared with machine learning, you have used various methods, but ensemble models probably you use deep learning combine the advantage of both deep learning models and combine them very general term people use is hyperparameter tuning so either you use different cost functions but it needs again a lot of training capacity of uh, machine capacities and try to different regularization methods let's say l1 l2 l3 and so on different activation functions. So people always clarify that RILU is a prominent activation functions. So these are some of the ways that you are able to do some improvement or try to say that, yes, my model is model prediction is very accurate. So I'd like to contribute one of the work that we have done, try to achieve how we achieve this accuracy. So when you look at this diagram, when you're on your left-hand side, we have used chest X-ray and COPS signals to do a prediction whether the patient has COVID or not. So two different inputs, let's say we look at the chest X-rays on the left, it uses data augmentation because medical data we cannot get, like simply you cannot add anything, actual data sets. So we do go for data augmentation and we do a data augmentation by make that as a grayscale image and all the pixel values zero to 25, 255, sorry. Then we change that cough model. Cough is a wave file, and wave file we use Fourier transformation and MEL spectrograms, change that into an image format so that you can also give a sequence model, sequence input to the model, okay? because the model is able to understand only the image inputs. So what I'm trying to say here is we just try to do some kind of work or modification on the data set in order to achieve this perfect accuracy. When you look at that performance category, accuracy is 95 for chest X-ray on your left, on your right is 91 percentage. So if you say that a person is, the person is having COVID by looking at the chest X-ray and the same person has the call, a wave file, and you, you try to get 80 percent or 89 percent or 70 percent. So that means that is something wrong. So we try to achieve this kind of things uh, in a one of the work that we try to use it. Okay? But do keep in mind, if you have a same data set is fine. 
what if you are getting a data set from different labs and different labs has their own optimal range and you may need to be careful or compare the results in order to build your system we need to create something that allows us to compare the results between the different labs then you do go for further processes okay the okay, second point that I'd like to say here is what are the pitfalls or what are the traps so i just flip through some newspaper i find this <laughs> until we have issues um, when we looked at this uh, vehicle in, uh, in self-driving test i think this is from uh, zoom x test vehicle crash in las vegas uh, very recently i think it's in if i'm mistaken it's around uh, i think this month yeah very very recent one okay but when you look at this type of uh, traps we may need to look at few things on your right hand side i just put phase one phase two phase three phase four <clears throat> i put that everything in one slide it's easy to handle this phase one definitely you may need to look at your problem definition real world problems is especially problematic controlled experiments give you better results as you go for real world problems definitely we may have plenty of pitfalls or plenty of traps you need to fix it so first thing you need to look at the formulated correctly second probably you may need to look at assuming more data will solve all your problems irrelevant features try to give a low quality data to, to decrease the upper bound performance of your reach so that is again you need to look into that third when i look at this uh, interesting image here your data must be looked at whether your data is Fourier correlations what do, you, what do you mean by this? When you look at this uh, particular uh, image, uh, the model will look at the tab. A tag here says classified as horse. Of course, it's in a different language, but you see that the heat map is allocated that area. Second image, I remove that. So that means you may not get classified this as a horse. What does it signify? The model is just focused on the labels or text, not actual image. So this is the danger. So you may need to either you do a grid search or a smooth smooth graded. This kind of things can be done uh, when you look at to avoid the traps, especially for those who are working on uh, machine learning or deep learning with image recognition or object recognition. Another point we'd like to assess here is a data mismatch between test and use cases. I think. Those people are working in on images. Image ImageNet is always giving us one orientation of image, rather than if your your object net has a proper controls or objects of all possible rotations, so that when you train the model, a deep learning model, it able to analyze in different orientation, and you will have better results. I can also say more. Ex examples in this point of direction generalization but when you look at the system performance again go back to a challenge here or a traps faulty inputs sensor malfunction or adverse influence on other parts of the system so we still have some issues in 2019 tesla has some issues and business point of view, since we are working on that area, the last one that we'll be focused here just to look for traps is the performance. So when you look at the performance, performance is not the outcome. So if you we look at this, Amazon is a demographic bias. So machine learning models act on human data or susceptible on demographics. So Amazon realized this. An AI recruiting tool was biased against women, even though there is no specification of gender in their CVs. And also, like, you can also say that violating the regulations, you spend a lot of money on this, but you just, the perfect model can be useless if it is, violates the regulation. So, the third point we are looking at how confident can we overcome the pitfalls or how certain you will be avoid this. So I just classify this into two, two areas. I'm not going to read everything. Let, let's look at the, the left-hand side. Standard avoidance for improvement. 
let's say you say that, oh, do not use simply machine learning or build your uh, project iteratively. So these are all computational way of doing things. But when you look at this, consider explainability and interpolability. interpolability. This really matters here. So on your right hand side, I just want to focus a few things post post hoc explanation methods, or we can say that explainable AI. So when you look at this uh, example here, so there is a model. So the model will say the data prediction says it's a blue. And there is a human involvement to make decisions. So the human involvement, the human needs to know what is the explanation here. So the explanation here, really, the particular person, even though it listed down the data prediction, a lot of constraints, sneeze, headache, fatigue, and no fatigue. So probably that could be the reason. So explanation methods are now available and models that are too complex for humans to easily interpret or a black box by extracting the relationship between the features can do predictions. We may need to look for future importances. One of the future importances people are using now is local interpretable model agnostic explanation that we call that as a line. Okay, you can see that there is a, a statement here, line, L-I-M-E, right? So what does it mean by this LIME? So this LIME method, it tried to give you a noise in the training data, something like perturbation, adding noise to the data or training data, but sometimes it to learn the parameters. So that is the first stage people are working now, how we are going to overcome this, or I can say that how confident can we overcome the big pulse? in the longer run. So people, there are methods coming in now. And rule-based methods, look at the surface level, conditions, predictions, salient maps, prototype approaches. I like the prototype approaches because explain a model with synthetic and natural input examples. So this will give us a very clearly where the model really misclassified. You can, can capture that. So they can be, you can avoid the traps for a longer run. Especially when you work on this uh, deep learning, there are a few methods, boosting methods, ensemble learning, average methods. So these are all the methods people are working on to avoid these traps. So we just come along with a few slides, just want to see what's happening now, whether this generative AI or open AI is really a solution for this. We'll discuss shortly. But this is traditionally different. Uh, when you say that gen generative AI is different from your traditional machine learning. So in that sense, it creates original content from example of art, music, and so on. So just the, the idea here, I just put here, we do have challenges after we are reaching now as a generative AI, open AI is still in market. People are using it, researchers are using it. Again, go back to the square is something like, model prediction, we still have challenges. How these Dale E2 is generating and how this uh, version of GP3 is, is, is displaying. So, but when you look at this uh, generative AI, few things here, either this generative AI do a classification, generation and transformation. Does it do any prediction? We need to wait and see. Elman Musk is working on that point. <laughs> I'm not sure. But this is the idea. So when you look at this point, actually, generative AI is slightly different from traditional machine learning. So do keep in mind, but still people are working on this area. And there are a lot of tools available just to overcome this. Yes, generative AI able to make a 100% accurate model. I don't think so. I, as a researcher, I wouldn't believe this. Since generative AI also designed by the researchers and programmers, we still need this earlier three points. Okay, back to the topic, the first slide. I want to showcase a small demo, what we have done, a public interest technology related uh, application. We have done this uh, in, during uh, COVID and uh, last year we have published. So this is an UI, it's a UI can input probably uh, 
an input of uh, images or chest X-ray image, as well as your ray file able to demonstrate. So this is a very quick tool for to establish a baseline range by training a hyperparameter space so that the patient have some involvement in this. So, so I think that's that's end my presentation. probably just start with this, um, this quote from a newspaper, which is wrongly accused uh, by an algorithm. Um, and it was first first known case of its kind where a faulty um, facial recognition match led to a Michigan man's arrest for a crime that he did not commit. And I mean, I'm very happy that I've kind of followed suit with um, Dr. Thomas because he kind of touched upon um, some of these very crucial um, ethical dilemmas of AI. So if you're wondering, I would like probably you to ponder any idea which year this news hit the headlines in USA. <clears throat> um, just think about it. Um, if you have thought 2015 or anything earlier, you would be wrong because this actually happened in 2020. So it's not a very old case. It's a very, very recent case. And there were more cases that have been listed afterwards. Um, it is one of those technologies that is used extensively by the law enforcement um, for facial recognition. So um, that is what I'm going to be talking about. I want to talk about um, the uh, development and using of AI responsibly and how we can actually get that done um, right from our classrooms. <clears throat> because I, I teach ethics and academic integrity is my area of main research. I have to give a disclaimer. Um, some of what I mentioned today are parts of presentation that have been taken from previous presentations of mine on cyber safety research, other presentations I've done in conferences, and parts of it will be from the longitudinal study that I conducted from 2008 to 2000, um, 2020. I hope to be able to touch upon some of the issues of um, artificial intelligence um, ethics uh, concerns and then look at iGens and alphas and millennium, you know, basically people we teach in our classrooms and how we can go about um, hoping that we can have some kind of a way forward where we can develop this kind of um, ethical understanding um, in the students. So <clears throat> we know there are forms of tech concerns that we've seen recently being discussed due to the um, fourth industrial revolution. Um, it includes all of these that's in front of you. Uh, because of time, I'm not going to read through each of these, but of course, the main ones are the discrimination, invasion of privacy, um, responsibility for consequences of automatic decision making, casualties from mechanical weaponization, and so on and so forth. But take, if we take a closer look, uh, in 2012, uh, Google introduced the addictive um, Gibson Gitter uh, with about 5.3 million hours of estimated time spent by viewers. That actually kind of comes down to eight lifetimes. So that's a lot of lifetimes, right? But that wasn't the ethical issue here. What I want to focus on is one of those initiative initiators was Ryan Germick, and he said they don't have much time for boring stuff like rules and that they don't use handbooks or focus groups. Now, that to me, as a computer science um, uh, academic, is an issue. Another example was the Blue Whale game. I think a lot of you may have heard about this. It was it was at its peak in 2017. And when they caught the guy who actually made it, it was Philip Budikin. Um, he was just 22 years old. And he said he was cleansing the society of biological waste. So that was his thought process behind building, developing that game, that particular game. Um, if you don't know what that is, that was the suicide game that kind of ultimately led to a lot of challenges. And the final thing was to commit suicide by certain method. And finally, of course, our Mark Zuckerberg. <clears throat> Um, if you don't know, we have about 40% of millennials who find him to be a role model and they want to be like him, right? Which is great because he's famous, he's popular, he, he's smart, he's built all of this and now he's, you know, in, he's leading metaverse. But then he also says things like, you can be unethical and still be legal. That's the way I live my life. Now, again, for me and his academic, that rings like a huge alarm because if he's the role model and he says that, that's what a lot of the students in my class are going to be inspired by. 
to who are these kids that I'm talking about. It's the millennials, now the iGens and the alphas. So I think it's a little bit important that we do make this distinction as to who we are talking about. Um, a lot of the study that I did was on the millennials, but then it moved on to the iGens, um, who are the generations from uh, 1997 onwards. And now we are looking at the alphas who are, you know, basically born into technology, right? Um, they are a lot more tech savvy than the millennials were, um, and they're not just sharing information, right? They're creating, they're producing, and they're governing information that's available over the cyberspace. Um, so while students in nursing, law, even auditing, for instance, accounts, um, have well-developed codes of professional ethics, they're expected to follow as part of their profession. Um, when it comes to software engineers, digital content developers, we are still looking at facing ethical dilemmas that are surprisingly not addressed or highlighted. And this was um, collectively looked at by a lot of different um, researchers over the years. So 4IR is here, it is infusing and integrating technology into and between physical, digital, and the biological world. We know that. But the speed at which it's infiltrating, um, the expectations of the evolution that we have, um, you know, has made software life cycle obscure, not requiring engineers to follow through all steps of development, because at the end, we are looking at the dollar signs, and that seems to be driving a lot of the evolution that we are talking about, minimizing the importance of looking at the customer analysis, impact and feedback, and so on and so forth. So... <clears throat> Ethical concerns over AI, I already spoke about one. Uh, Dr. Thomas uh, spoke about quite a few, but here's one that we might actually be facing on a day-to-day. -day. Um, this, this example that I'm gonna show you is inspired by UNESCO. So if you go to Google and you actually type schoolboy, these are the kind of images that immediately pop up, which is well and good, this is what you would expect. But if you type schoolgirl, have a look at the ones particularly that I have highlighted. I have not put them in there. This is what Google has brought back to me. And you can see how sexualized the girls' um, images are. And that seems to be the narrative that comes through. Now, um, it, you know, it, you have to understand that, of course, that AI, you know, AI is involved, a very complex AI is involved in the search and ranking of the findings that you have. But as you can see, in no way is it unbiased. That's an issue because the person who was programming probably didn't take into consideration the kind of bias that would come through from the people's clicks and ultimately the ranking that would be happening. Um, the next thing that I'm gonna show you is more into our own um, industry, which is education. And what I'm showing you basically is check text generating algorithm, which is a free website. Um, it allows you about 10,000 words um, if you haven't signed up. If you sign up, you can do more and you go across the paywall. It becomes even more, um, you know, helpful. Um, what this does basically, it is um, a language model that's using machine learning to produce human-like text. This has become really prolific um, post-pandemic, and it has become a huge issue for lecturers um, globally, everywhere in the world. This is the one that we are all talking about, because where do we draw the line? What the assignment that I'm marking, if you look at what I actually put here, I said AI is ethical. And if you actually read the text that it came up with, it genuinely sounds like somebody could have written this, right? And you wouldn't, as a lecturer, instantly go into the point where you'd be thinking, was this generated by artificial intelligence or was this really written by my student? So this in itself causes a, poses a huge problem in the academic world um, where we have to then pause and think, what are we really assessing when a student is submitting the work? I, I think there's a precipice with this where we are actually kind of debating between how calculators kind of became a part of the uh, mathematical classes uh, versus AI text generators. And are they going to be the next uh, next thing that becomes OK in our classrooms or not? And if they're not, then where do we draw the line? And is it student cheating? So looking at traditional ethics and cyber ethics, ethics is basically beliefs, norms, and goals that differ as per various ethical principles. So you could be looking at conse uh, consequentialism, or you could be looking at, um, uh, you know, um, 
looking at intentions. But when we're looking at cyber ethics, it is more about the responsible use of the cyberspace by governing its procedures, values, and practices. Now, this is important because many industries, as we saw with all our speakers previously, are venturing into the new frontiers using big data, machine learning, blockchain, meta, now meta, of course, is in the picture. And we've seen some great examples of how these can be harnessed in business and so on and so forth. Right. But just as the potential for progress is great with AI, um, especially in helping communities achieve United Nations sustainable goals, so are the possible dangers, because not every possibility is fully realized or comprehended by developers and users. Um, we do have um, AI ethics frameworks. Um, for instance, the examples that I've given in front of you, this one is from NITI, uh, which was published by World Economic Forum for India. We've got Australia has their own artificial intelligent ethics framework. Um, US intelligence community has um, principles of AI ethics. Um, our very own Dubai, the digital Dubai, has their artificial intelligent principles and ethics. But the problem is all of these exist, but um, the issue is if they're being implemented evenly or unevenly, and none of them are truly global. So UNESCO came together in, 19, uh, in 2021 and had 193 state members sign a recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And that seems to be now the guiding um, light, so to speak, kind of like a bedrock, um, allowing for the ethical guidelines to be the no global nor nor normative. So we understand the vital importance of AI ethics as foundation for protecting individuals, right? But at the same time, we know that it needs to be developed in a manner that it is for the human and not you know, against the human. So this is where um, I quickly wanna just touch upon the longitudinal study. It was done over a period of 10 years. Um, we looked at both millennials and iGens because it was such a long study um, along with my colleagues. And it did highlight the impact of teaching cyber ethics, particularly helped in changing students' perceptions on artificial intelligence. And that was tracked by basically looking at um, journal entries, reflection, reflective journal entries on how that was changing their idea of where that draw line is and where we should draw that line. So that leads me to my conclusion, which I'm hoping is the future, um, where we want to propose um, coming together to co-design and corporate uh, collaborate across faculties. So business faculties and engineering faculties to come together um, and develop a teaching module on responsible academic um, artificial intelligence that helps enhance student understanding. Because as Rowan said in the beginning, we know with great power comes great responsibility. But here's the problem. Um, even for Spider-Man, his Uncle Ben was his moral compass. So we need to have some kind of a module in there that actually helps, you know, you know, even up the fields for our students and kind of start that conversation. Thank you so much. Um... I'm very moved. So what I'm going to first do is ask uh, Dr. Robert Abbas to give a reflection. Thank you so much, Professor Michael. Thank you so very much to Dr. Bandara, to Dr. Bian, to Dr. Wen Lee, Dr. Bhattacharya, Associate Professor Thomas and Dr. Zenith Reza Khan. Katina, oh, I, I'm equally as overwhelmed. I think we've just been in for a treat in terms of having access to this multifaceted and multidisciplinary interdisciplinary treatment of so many themes relevant to AI and we're so thankful to have these insights and to have such research being conducted in the UOW global community I think is just phenomenal. I particularly valued uh, the weaving of theory with application, so talking to strategy, to ideas of real world project examples, technological and implementation related aspects and just so much more that we can spend quite some time unpacking and dissecting what we've heard today. Research on so many levels, Katina, and just so complimentary. Um, uh, so Katina, thank you for indulging me. I might spend a moment, a few minutes, reflecting on each of the presentations. I just think it really warrants a, an individual reflection uh, to really speak to some of the ideas raised by our wonderful speakers, our UOW colleagues. Start off with Dr. Bandara um, talking to the connection between AI and, and leadership. So many rich themes, talking to ethics, Ruan, to values, responsibility, and power, and leaving us with um, our quote that we've referenced multiple times today. Also, the importance and significance of responsible leadership. 
but I really appreciate how you tied that to stakeholder relationships and the management of those relationships towards social change. And I think that's a really crucial point. Um, you also spoke about data-driven human resource management, embedding it in that example. And again, that link to responsible leadership, to digital leadership is something I think we need to look into in a lot more detail. Moving on to Dr. Bian, who spoke about enterprise digitalization, virtual reality, and its transformational nature or transformative nature in the context of the metaverse. We looked at specific markets or context, spoke to metaverse strategy, the contributions to the economy, and so many other concepts. So I really appreciated the emphasis on user and organizational context, for example, uh, the ideas of platforms for commercial um, or for collaboration, these commercial platforms that bring with them new businesses um, or new business collaborative and advertising models. More specifically, Dr. Bian, you mentioned a new business environment, among other really important Important aspects tying to the four P's, reminding us that we need to look at people, we need to look at place, we need to look at product and process. And then you spoke to stakeholders complementing uh, Dr. Vandara's comments by looking at the industrial ecology, which was really uh, fascinating. And then finalizing things by saying, look, there are these great opportunities, but what about the risks and advantages, which you highlighted and emphasized? We need further work in this domain. We go on then to hear from Dr. Wen Lin speaking about fintech as a specific example, extending our discussion from the previous two speakers, which was quite outstanding, Katina. Um, really interesting how almost a storyline was being formed. Um, you extended our discussion regarding multi-stakeholder perspectives, stakeholders in this industrial ecology, as we spoke about, to discussion specifically of competencies. And that was very helpful um, in view of your presentation, Dr. Wen Lin, uh, regarding competence management as a core feature, building on Dr. Bandera's talk of human resources and the human resource function in an organization, um, the application to finance and to financial institutions in view of the digital transformation was incredibly helpful. And then you provided us with that brilliant overview of blockchain, of robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, in view of so much more picking up on impact, which was great, so economic impacts. And we very much look forward to hearing more from you in this space about your work. And I think we're just scratching the surface with all our speakers. Uh, when we think about Dr. Bhattacharya's talk, um, so impressive, uh, such an impressive presentation on data science, predictive analytics, and so many other related themes. Um, the clarity of your presentation, where you embedded data science within a business context was outstanding. Um, so you set your, or you uh, encourage us to think about setting out um, and focusing on the business problem noting your prescriptive framework, a framework for applying predictive analytics to business practice. So I really like the narrative and the logic of your presentation. So you started off by saying, we need to look at the business goals, then we need to think about objectives, then the contextual questions and the nature of those questions and constraints in order to select an appropriate method using the identify frameworks. And I'm not sure about you, Katina, and our fellow attendees and presenters. That was one of the most um, seamless presentations of that process. Um, so clear, um, Dr. Bhattacharya was so informative and educational. And I think it would be wonderful to host an entire workshop on that specific topic so we can learn more. And we very much look, look forward to following your project and moving forward also um, in terms of the suggestions for future research, which you so wonderfully highlighted. Um, and then we sort of went in depth, in further depth, technically speaking, with Associate Professor Dr. Thomas, uh, learning about machine learning, about accuracy of deep learning models, which is a very difficult area to, to really articulate and to present in this kind of form and in such a succinct uh, time frame as well. So the accuracy of these deep learning models with respect to their challenges, to the improvement opportunities through future engineering, through multiple algorithms and other techniques, models and methods that you so kindly shared with us. Um, Dr. Thomas, I just wanted to note that the depth of your overview of the themes and application to both recent news items and the real world context with, I think it was called COVIDnet was exceptional. Um, we enjoyed the demo, quite brief, we'd love to learn more. Um, and we really enjoyed you emphasizing the pit 
pitfalls and the traps as you framed it as part of the phases because that was a very clever way to articulate it um, and also um, leaving us thinking about the importance of formulation and comprehending the data and those associated traps and pitfalls and last but most definitely not least Dr Zenith Reza Khan who spoke about um, the importance of developing and using AI responsibly actually presented us with quite a chilling account of a range of examples that really demonstrate the concerns associated with technology as relevant to the new generations, to the millennials, the iGens and the alpha, um, who are creating, producing and governing the information. And, and um, I think something that I've taken away, uh, Dr Khan, from your presentation is the need for professionalization of the software engineering uh, industry, profession, uh, the evolution of technology has largely been driven by profitability, which renders the software development cycles quite obscure. And that is really concerning and something I'd love to talk to you about offline in a lot more detail, sort of a passion project of ours, Katina and I, to look at those models and see where we can improve. Um, you shed light on ethical concerns, traditional ethics, cyber ethics and AI ethics. And I'm not sure, I've not seen a presentation that has done so, so succinctly, so clearly uh, in an area that's just so rich that touches on so many disciplines. So we really value that. Um, the dominant narratives that you mentioned coming through when we think about AI and its application, and then rounding off the discussion by talking about the educational context and beyond. Uh, and I think where you left us off was really valuable in terms of potentially where we can work as in terms of the UAW community, but also the global community, where you shared with us your longitudinal study and ended on the importance of interdisciplinary collaboration through co-design, so beautifully put, so beautifully articulated and expressed. And um, so in summary, and thank you for providing me with the opportunity to provide that reflection, um, it appears that much work is required much work has been done, but there seems to be an end-to-end -end story that's emerging here, as Katina mentioned in the chat, from the strategic implications right through to implementation-related considerations and challenges. Um, my final comments are that you know, in terms of reflecting is we feel very fortunate that individuals such as yourself are looking to address these opportunities and challenges, and we very much look forward to uh, highlighting your work and also collaborating into the future. Thank you, Katina, and thank you, team. What a rich and moving um, reflection, Roba. And uh, I was going to ask the team a really hard question about AI, but given we're almost out of time, what I'm going to do instead is give everyone about 60 seconds just to give a final comment in whatever capacity they want. Um, could be to do with their talk. It could be to do with somebody else's talk. It could be to do with the occasion. But Ruan, you were first up in presenting, so I'm wondering if you could unmute and share with us just one final comment. All right, thanks, thanks, Professor Katina. First, uh, first of all, it's it's a privilege to be here listening to these uh, wonderful people. So my my key takeaway is, is that uh, it's it's a fascinating future we have with technology, but uh, as I said, technology it's 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 come with certain challenges and it's it's up to us individuals to address them and not only looking into the benefits of it, but rather address these challenges and ensure that, uh, you know, we, we thrive as, as humans uh, uh, dealing with these uh, or the, the negative sides and, and ensuring that uh, we all, all uh, have something to benefit out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Bian, you're next. Yes. Uh, thanks, Ruan. So just as Ruan mentioned, like uh, enterprises and are exp uh, experiencing another wave of challenges. So uh, to achieve a new level, so AI will be like leveraged to help, like, for instance, in my case, the metaverse applications to provide more uh, comprehensive scenarios for supporting organizations in their digital transformation. And one thing that like, comes to my mind is like, uh, uh, for instance, like uh, we know that we need more data to improve the model performance, to improve user experiences. Like for instance, in, but in Meta, like how enterprise can be permission to collect not just the demographic information, but also like the biometric data from their users, such as like uh, sociological response, brain waves, patterns, so and so forth. So uh, in my uh, case, it's like the metaverse is a brand new enterprise 
platform for many new technologies and people as well as most business managers. So in future, more work is needed to be prototype and to test metaverse-based solutions for organizations and business transformations. Wow, Thank you. What, a, what a closing statement. Um, Wen Lin. Yeah, uh, uh, I think come to the business digitalizations, uh, one of the main concern is the, the, the cost involved, uh, the, the investment. And uh, talking about also the metaverse, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the good example should be Roblox. Roblox uh, computer game uh, that uh, is a very good uh, example uh, because uh, Roblox actually, uh, they can use uh, what they call the Ethereum uh, blockchain, uh, allow the user to build and uh, play uh, and uh, monetize uh, their, this uh, virtual gaming experience. And uh, Roblox actually currently is one of the, the I think, the fastest growing and largest platform for uh, in uh, this uh, metaverse. <laughs> I think uh, a lot a lot of people are actually spending a lot of time and money on it. Yeah. They sure are. Yes, thank you, Wenlin. Uh, over thank to you, Prithvi. First of all, thank you, Dr. Katina and Dr. Roba for this amazing uh, opportunity to get all of us together. I think I greatly ben benefited from it. Uh, one of the key takeaways for me was like, uh, I come from a combination background of business and technology. So uh, I'm, I'm always been thinking about how this technology can benefit business. What are the critical success factors? And that's kind of my mindset. But with the talks uh, that we had uh, by the speakers today, especially Dr. Joshua and Dr. Zenith, uh, it forced me to look in a different direction altogether. It's, it's not just all about profits. It's about uh, what it's doing to the society and, and the ethics aspect of it. I think it was really an eye opener. So I want to thank everyone. And uh, uh, it was an honor for me to be a part of this uh, colloquium. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prithvi. Over to you, Dr. Joshua. Yeah, again, uh, <laughs> it's a new experience for me. Usually my presentation is, is only for computer science graduates and computer science crowd. And this is the first time uh, I think I'm looking at a different perspective. And uh, I think the, the researchers from business background and uh, ethics consideration, and these are the areas that people are really working on. And uh, especially on business point of view, uh, not only looking for money, as uh, Prithvi says, uh, so ethics, uh, AI ethics is, is really a danger thing is coming to market now. And we are, the researchers are working towards on transdisciplinary way of handling it. And I'm happy that I'm part of the, uh, the project with Ruan and uh, another one is from um, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. So two different perspectives. So first one is about the, with business, with, uh, with Katina and the Ruan team. The second one is about in nursing healthcare and how to develop a computational a digitize the, the, the model. So after looking at there are there are many people or so youngsters are working towards on pure computer science and researchers like us, uh, it, we have to look into a multidisciplinary perspective and try to do some contribution on that to the society and the world. So that is my. Uh, main thing that I can involve myself in the transdisciplinary. It's not easy to be a bit transdisciplinary and we just present it you know, all computational way of doing things. Uh, but this is a challenge. I think I will get used to it so soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, Dr. Ruba and uh, Katina. And we are in a different part of the world and uh, we are having uh, different schedules and so on and so forth. Still, still we are here. Uh, and I'm at home now. <laughs> yes. Just, yes. Uh, just take off and just come back here. And uh, thanks so much. And I look forward to see you again with a new Thank you, Dr. Another, Joshua. Another, another presentation. Yeah. We will. We will for sure. Uh, and Dr. Zenith, to you. Over to you. Um, uh, you know, this is saved the best for the last, but probably I have nothing to say because everybody's already said it. But um, I guess I would like to, of course, start by thanking um, Professor Katina and Dr. Um, Roba for this amazing opportunity. All the speakers, you guys have been so amazing to listen to because um, such diverse views on AI, right? Because again, I think a lot like Dr. Thomas, um, because I'm in AI computers, we only talk about computers, um, computer students as well, right? So think, looking at the applications and the possibilities, it's just amazing to hear that um, and kind of takes us back, okay, we need to go back to the drawing board and look at how can we be more human centric uh, when it comes to developing and using AI so that 
you know, the, our future generations are doing this right. Um, they are looking at human um, human uh, benefit, but at the same time, of course, making money while they're at it. Uh, it's very important, I think, uh, that everybody works uh, together so that we can make sure that all our students are well prepared for the future, um, not just with developing technology or using it, but doing it responsibly. Thank you. Thank you, Zenith, for those wise words. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Abbas uh, to help us close today. Thank you so much, Professor Michael, and thank you for those closing remarks. I learned so much from each of the presentations. What a way to finish in terms of remarks about transdisciplinarity, human-centered design, and so much more. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time today. We could keep these conversations going for many more hours, but I did want to just um, issue a reminder, Katina, before we close, that if you'd like to listen to any part of today's recording or share it with a colleague, please feel free to follow our programs, which are archived on both IEEE TV and Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society's YouTube channel. We've got a playlist there from Series 1, right through to series four. I'll certainly be reviewing this recording and other recordings um, moving forward, but I would like to hand over to you, Katina, to officially close the fourth series. And thank you again to our excellent speakers and the presentations today. Thank you, Roba. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all the speakers of the series four. It was just exceptional to hear from all of you. Um, there's a little story I'm going to share with you. Uh, President, Crow uh, of ASU actually visited UW in 2016, uh, the year before I made my first visit to Arizona, and he was looking for a partner organization, a partner university, and uh, we missed out, that's okay, University of New South Wales uh, got the Plus Alliance Award, but the ties with URW were not uh, unseen. Our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, Professor Judy Raper, is actually at a Plus Alliance affiliation. Teddy London, where she's really heading up a, a very innovative uh, engineering school that's very transdisciplinary and very much practical and very much into prototyping. Uh, not long after I joined ASU, but I never forgot uh, my roots at URW, and I'm very proud to be now an honorary uh, in the School of Business alongside all of you. Um, and how amazing it is to continue with research. But there's one person uh, I need to acknowledge here, which is the glue between URW and ASU, and that's Dr. Robert Abbas, who was also uh, a visiting professor uh, at ASU earlier in the year and maintained uh, her uh, volunteerism uh, throughout the whole of this session. It's not easy week in, week out to do what we do. Uh, it's pretty much not recognised, uh, but I would like to recognise it as being the most trans institutional, the most transdisciplinary, the most trans everything you can think of, uh, because that's what it is. It's when for no reason whatsoever and no money, uh, no benefit, no acclaim, no nothing, that you offer your time to produce these amazing discussions. And that's what they are. They're a meeting of minds and it would not have happened without Robert's tireless effort. And, you know, the, the brainchild behind uh, gatherings like this, it's been co-joined. They would never have happened, folks. I would never have probably called on you uh, had it not been for her involvement because it would have been centred in the US somewhere. But in, in terms of what has happened, it's gold. It's, you know, amazing events like these. And if I can just comment, um, sometimes uh, people forget their roots and their humble beginnings. I never do. I spent over 20 years at uh, UOW, almost exactly. I started the year that Zena started in 2001, and we had discussions back in the early 2000s, I recall, uh, for uh, transdisciplinary teaching in Dubai when we started to run uh, courses in both locations uh, and that were accredited through the Australian Computer Society given you give testamers out in the, uh, at UOW Dubai. But as a closing, thank you for coming so professionally, so incredibly with all your new insights ready to share, and so methodically, we are the honoured at ASU and URW to have you as probably the most innovative group that's presented in raw, in raw their uh, research uh, without saying, oh, I'm trying to hide this or I'm trying not to share, I'm trying to keep this back. That's what's missing from many of the other institutions uh, in the top 1%, the URW is a top 1% institution, we don't forget that, but in the top 50, say, it's this willingness to give, 
and to give so honestly and that's what we saw today this um wanting to share and i think what has begun today is an incredible future research trajectory i think dr Aberson, over commenting throughout all of these sessions and your presentations that that's the organic next step you have done this beginning process and we just will follow <laughs> with what we can share and let's hope for many projects many grants cross institutional uh, cross disciplinary and um may we continue this marvelous marvelous union so with that i close and say a celebration to all of you Robert did dare me to get up and dance but i think i'll do that after i press the leave button <laughs> so have a wonderful wonderful week and thank you so much to all of you bye for now